So we're going to start the discussion of completable futures by giving a little background that'll hopefully explain the context for where this stuff comes from. And I do this deliberately because most people are familiar with this first topic, but as we get into the asynchronous stuff, depending on your background, you may be less familiar with that approach. So I want to do this gently. So we'll start off by talking about the pros and cons of synchrony. And the whole point of this is to motivate why we need to have futures and completable futures. But, but bear with me, it'll, it'll take a little while to get there. We'll probably finish this up on Wednesday. So as I sort of alluded to at the end of the last slide deck on the reactive model, method calls in traditional Java programs, most of the stuff you've probably written up to this point, are largely synchronous. For example, if you make a method call on a hash map or an array list in Java Collections framework, those are synchronous calls. The behaviors that you run in stream aggregate operations, the method references and lambda expressions, those are typically synchronous if you don't know about what we're going to talk about later. Um, and what happens here with a synchronous approach is a caller makes a call and the, uh, the caller borrows the thread of control, sorry, the callee, this guy, borrows the thread of control of the caller until the computation finishes. So up here, this guy makes a call, the callee borrows the thread, when it's finished it returns the result, the caller makes another call, the callee borrows a thread of control, returns the result, makes another call, borrows a thread of control, returns the result. So it's kind of this request response style interaction. You can kind of see it visualized here, right? So these calls are typically referred to as request response calls. Should be familiar. I would be willing to bet most of what you've done, unless you've been doing a lot of asynchronous JavaScript programming, probably looks something like this, especially with the job that you've done. Well, there are pros and cons to doing things this way. The benefits of synchronous calls is they're very intuitive to program and debug because that's usually what we've learned from day one. So this kind of request response model is very simple. Maps nicely onto two-way recall, two-way calling patterns, two-way method patterns. You invoke a method, you pass some parameters, you get a result. What could be simpler than that? One other reason why this is fairly easy to reason about is because the state of the local caller, whatever method is making the call, is retained and is available when the callee returns. And it's stored in something called an activation record. You may or may not have learned about activation records yet. Hopefully when you take a compiler course, they'll talk about activation records, like CS270 should talk about that. But let me give you a quick example of what I'm talking about when I refer to this. So here's a method called download content. And you can see this thing goes ahead and allocates a buffer of bytes. And it goes ahead and allocates a byte array output stream. It goes ahead and allocates an input stream. So buff, OS, and IS are all things that are allocated as local state that lives on the activation record of that download content method, which is part of the stack of activation records. And then when this loop is run here, every time we call read, that of course pushes a new stack, new, new uh, activation record onto the runtime stack of activation records to carry out the read call. And when, re when read returns, it updates bytes and IS is still the same as before. Buff is still the same as before. When we say os.write, we pass in buff. That'll obviously push a new activation record on the stack for the write call. When that returns, everything is in the right place. The values make the right sense. And that's because they've been stored magically for you on the current activation record in the runtime stack. So you don't have to keep track of that state manually. It's done for you automatically. That's the whole point of using a stack, is to make method calls easy and seamless to reason about. There's some downsides, however. One of the things that you can't do with, or it's hard to do with synchronous calls, you can do it, but it's harder, is to leverage all the available parallelism in a multi-core system. And uh, there's a couple different reasons for this. One of the reasons for why this is hard is that if you have synchronous calls, you're going to block. And as we've talked about before, when you block, you start incurring these extra 
overheads. So synchronization, context switching, data movement, memory management, these things all cost something. And it doesn't just come for free. And if you're not careful, you can end up with a system that's got lots of threads running around, and they're blocking, and it's confusing, and, and hard to reason about, and inefficient. I always like this, uh, this diagram to sort of illustrate the point, right? So what we'd like to have is you know, a bunch of threads that are just off minding their own business, eating out of their own bowl. But in practice, this is what it really looks like, right? Everybody starts going crazy, and everything's get overrun, and it's complicated and error prone. Another thing that makes this difficult is selecting the right number of threads to use for blocking synchronous operations can be rather tricky. And we've talked about this several times back along the way. So let's imagine we've got some kind of image stream gang program, which we talked about before, and we want to have a way to download an image. Well, how many threads should we put in our pool to do this? What's the right trade-off between performance and resource utilization. And it turns out it's, it's sometimes hard to figure this out with synchronous calls. So one thing we could do is we could allocate a whole lot of threads, which will make things run efficiently, because then whenever one thread blocks, there's other threads that are available to, to run. But we'll end up using a lot of threads. So that could be inefficient from a resource management point of view. The alternative approach is to minimize the number of threads. So you'll have efficient resource utilization. But then you've got a bunch of threads sitting around, or a bunch of cores, rather, um, sitting around not being used properly. So you've got to pick the right choice. Now, we have talked about various ways to do this um, before in the context of you know, setting those properties, using managed blockers, and so on. But this is tricky, and it's particularly tricky when we talk about IO-bound programs, where you need to have more threads to run efficiently. So the point is that this can be a little hard. Um, and if you're not familiar with some of the tricks of changing the size of the streams, common fork join pool, that can be tricky. You can also use the managed blocker, but that can be tricky. There's lots of tricky things you need to do. So that's a quick summary of the pros and cons of, of synchrony. Now, obviously, uh, the whole point of this was really to say there's got to be something better than classic synchronous programming. And it turns out that there is. The, the tricky part here, the, the other side of the equation, is synchrony is pretty easy to program, pretty easy to reason about. So we're going to find out that asynchronous programming, which is what we'll do on Wednesday, gives you a performance win, but at the cost of some additional complexity. So obviously, to keep track of the complexity, we'll need a framework like completable futures. So that's what we'll talk about next time.